Welcome to CNU, the video series that will teach you everything you need to know to provide excellent nutrition care. In this video, I am going to provide you with an introduction to one of the pillars of clinical nutrition, and that is nutrition support. By the end of the video, you should be able to define nutrition support, identify the two types of nutrition support, and determine when to use each type of nutrition support. If you find this video helpful, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Let's get started. If you are tuning into a video on nutrition support, then I probably don't have to tell you that nutrition is at the foundation of health. When we supply our body with the nutrients it needs, not only does it give us the ability to survive, it also gives us the ability to thrive. Although nutrition care is largely preventative, meaning it assists in the prevention of disease, it is also therapeutic, meaning it plays a role in healing. In other words, eating well can put the body in the best position to recover from sickness and injury. Unfortunately, sickness and injury can negatively affect our ability to eat, and in many instances, as the severity of an illness worsens, so does that ability. This results in a number of patients whose eating capabilities are largely disabled and others who are unable to eat at all. When this is the case, we have nutrition support. Simply put, nutrition support is a method of feeding someone who cannot obtain enough nutrients from food to prevent significant unintentional weight loss. There are two types of nutrition support, enteral nutrition and parenteral nutrition, and so we can also frame it as, it is the provision of enteral nutrition or parenteral nutrition to prevent or treat malnutrition. This is the definition used by the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, or ASPEN, an organization that is considered to be the gold standard for sharing information regarding nutrition support in the United States. So, we have nutrition support, and then under nutrition support, we have enteral nutrition and parenteral nutrition. Enteral nutrition is tube feeds, or tube feedings, because that is how it is achieved. A tube bypasses the mouth, and nutrients are delivered directly into the stomach or small intestine. By doing this, a patient can receive all of the nutrients he or she needs without having to eat. Enteral nutrition is not intravenous nutrition, or nutrients delivered directly into the bloodstream, and enteral nutrition is not eating. The tube can be placed through the nose or mouth or inserted through the abdominal wall. A tube placed through the nose or mouth is used when enteral nutrition is needed for six weeks or less. A tube inserted through the abdominal wall is used when enteral nutrition is needed for more than six weeks or if the patient's medical condition prevents a tube from passing through the oral or nasal cavity and esophagus. Parenteral nutrition is intravenous nutrition. This is when nutrients are delivered directly into the bloodstream. Unlike enteral nutrition, it does not use the gastrointestinal tract. Common infusion sites for parenteral nutrition include the forearm, elbow joint, chest, and neck. In summary, we have enteral nutrition, which is tube feeding, and we have parenteral nutrition, which is feeding intravenously. Enteral nutrition uses the gastrointestinal tract. Parenteral nutrition uses the veins. One way I like to remember the difference is EN is closer to eating. I can't stress this basic difference enough because even very successful medical professionals get it wrong all the time. Guys, you don't want to be the student, trainee, or seasoned professional who does the same. Now that we have established what nutrition support is, and how it is provided through enteral or parenteral nutrition, I want to spend some time providing specific examples of who is most likely to benefit from it. To do this, I have created a stoplight with each color representing a group of patients. The green light represents patients who are eating well both before and during their hospitalization. 
These patients can be classified as well-nourished with overall good appetite and ability to eat. Examples include a 23-year-old man who is otherwise healthy but broke his leg in a car crash and needed surgery, and a 78-year-old woman who is undergoing further evaluation for chest pain but has no other symptoms or medical conditions that affect her ability to eat. The yellow light represents patients who have at least some capacity to eat, but suffer from a condition that might limit their ability to eat enough for weight maintenance. These patients can be classified as having an appetite level and calorie intake that is questionable. Examples include an elderly cancer patient who has been suffering from decreased appetite and altered taste while undergoing chemotherapy, and a middle-aged man who suffered from a stroke and is currently only able to eat foods that are pureed. Finally, we have the red light, which represents patients who cannot eat at all. These patients can be classified as having an obvious inability to eat regardless of appetite level. Examples include the need for a ventilator, severe swallowing difficulty, and an obstruction of the gastrointestinal tract. Like a stoplight, the colors guide your response. Green means go. Since it is clear these patients are eating well, we let them go. They do not require any kind of nutrition support. Red means stop. Because of the obvious inability to eat, patients in the red group are automatically considered as possible candidates for nutrition support. We stop and figure out if nutrition support will begin and how it will be administered. Yellow means slow down. For these patients, the response is much less clear. They must be thoroughly assessed to determine whether or not they need nutrition support. Some will end up needing it, and others will not. This is where the ability of the clinician to collect data and engage in critical thinking and problem solving can really shine through. The three most important areas to focus on are the physical assessment, unintentional weight loss, and recent estimated calorie intake. There are guidelines available for assessing each of these aspects of the patient. The exact parameters may vary slightly from institution to institution, but here are some of the common ones. For physical assessment, the poorly nourished patient will have moderate to severe fat and muscle loss to areas like the face, shoulders, clavicle, triceps, and quadriceps. For assessment of weight history, or unintentional weight loss, the poorly nourished patient will have lost greater than 5% of their body weight in one month, greater than 7.5% of their body weight in three months, greater than 10% of their body weight in six months, or at least 20% of their body weight in one year. For estimated calorie intake, the poorly nourished patient will be meeting less than or equal to 50% of their estimated calorie needs for greater than one week, or less than or equal to 75% of their estimated calorie needs for one month or longer. The estimated calorie intake is usually the biggest trigger for starting nutrition support, especially if the poor intake has no clear end in sight. In some textbooks, we see this written more plainly as inadequate oral intake or an anticipated inadequate oral intake for 7 to 14 days. A patient does not have to satisfy all of the criteria to be considered for enteral nutrition. However, the more criteria he or she meets, the stronger the case to begin nutrition support. Such an occurrence should result in an immediate discussion between the doctor who is responsible for the patient, a registered dietitian, a registered nurse, as well as the patient, a pharmacist, a speech-language pathologist, and a social worker can also be part of this discussion. And if the patient does not have the capacity to make medical decisions on their own, the healthcare proxy should be involved. This is usually a family member or close friend. 
Once you figure out that someone is a candidate for nutrition support, the next step is to determine whether the patient should receive enteral nutrition or parenteral nutrition. For this, we have the saying, if the gut works, use it. In other words, if a patient has a gastrointestinal tract that can safely receive nutrients, absorb nutrients, and eliminate waste, then enteral nutrition should be used instead of parenteral nutrition. This means parenteral nutrition should be mostly reserved for when a patient does not have the ability to carry out these functions. Examples include an intestinal obstruction, a severe gastrointestinal bleed, and severe malabsorption. Enteral nutrition is preferred over parenteral nutrition for a number of reasons. The four I will mention here are 1. Gut stimulation. This is because using the gastrointestinal tract helps to maintain or improve its structure or function. Feeding the gut bacteria may also help to strengthen the immune response. Number 2. Lower risk of infection. Patients are less likely to get infections with enteral nutrition than they are with parenteral nutrition. Number 3. Fewer metabolic complications. This is because patients on parenteral nutrition are more likely to develop dangerous electrolyte abnormalities and liver dysfunction. And number four, cost effectiveness. When compared to parenteral nutrition, enteral nutrition is less expensive for the patient and the medical provider. Once again, if the gut works, use it. Here is a summary for this lesson. Nutrition support is a method of feeding someone who cannot obtain enough nutrients from food to prevent significant unintentional weight loss, and it includes enteral nutrition and parenteral nutrition. Enteral nutrition is more like eating because it uses the gastrointestinal tract. Parenteral nutrition is intravenous nutrition. It uses the veins. When it comes to deciding if a patient will benefit from nutrition support, we ask, can the patient eat enough by mouth? If the answer is a resounding yes, then the patient continues to eat and does not need nutrition support. If the answer is a resounding no, then we ask, can the GI tract be used? A yes to this question leads us to consider enteral nutrition, and a no leads us to consider parenteral nutrition. But what if the answer is maybe? In this case, we ask, does the patient meet any of the three criteria for poor nutritional status? Those criteria were physical assessment, unintentional weight loss, and estimated calorie intake, which we may also see as inadequate oral intake or an anticipated inadequate oral intake for 7 to 14 days. If the patient does not meet any of the criteria, then the patient continues to eat and does not need nutrition support. If the patient satisfies one, two, or all three criteria, then we can consider nutrition support. When deciding if a patient should receive enteral nutrition or parenteral nutrition, we must always remember, if the gut works, use it. If the gastrointestinal tract can safely receive nutrients, absorb nutrients, and eliminate waste, we will want to give enteral nutrition. Thank you for watching. Check out these videos for more content just like this.